In this video, we talk about a second limit definition of derivative. Um, what the, the result would be when we try to use the limit definition to compute a derivative where the function has a vertical tangent line. And we'll look at um, an example of that. And then we look at some derivative terminology and notation. Uh, let's see. So we'll look at the definition of differentiation and continuous rate of change, what it means for a function to be differentiable at x, differentiable on an open interval from a to b. And the fact that f prime of c does not exist is equivalent to the fact that f prime of c is undefined. Um, and then we'll also, I mentioned notation. We want to look at notation for higher order derivatives, which just means we're taking the derivative multiple times. So remember, in the last video, we said that f prime of x, that's the derivative of f at location x, represents the slope of the tangent line. To the graph of f, and then where at that particular x value. And it's given by the limit as delta x approaches zero of f of x plus delta x minus f of x divided by delta x. This is just change in y over change in x. We can think of this as the slope of the secant line. And then we take the limit of the slope of the secant as the denominator goes to zero, we get the slope of the tangent line. This is a definition that I would use. When I am interested in finding the derivative at more than one location. So if I don't know what x value I'm interested in, but maybe I'm interested in the derivative or the slope of the tangent line at a number of different points, I would use this to find a formula for the slope of the tangent line. And then once I have that formula, I can plug in various x values like we did in the last video. So let's say we'll use this when we're interested in finding a prime at more than one value of x. Now, if we're just interested in the derivative at one particular x value, we can compute the slope of the secant line in a slightly different way. So the derivative of f at x naught can also be written this way. Take the limit as x approaches x naught, where x naught is a finite number, of f of x minus f of x naught divided by x minus x naught. Now this is still the slope of the secant line. That hasn't changed at all. So we've got our curve, here's x naught, there's the corresponding y value, f of x naught. And we're saying, okay, let's find a nearby point. And that's x, and then corresponding y value is f of x. Find a secant line between those two points. Yeah. And then we say the slope of the secant is change in y, this y value minus this y value over change in x, this x value minus this x value. And then we're going to let this x value approach x naught, which is the same as letting that q a point uh, approach p like we did in the last video. Um, just the notation is a little bit different. Um, that makes it easier to find the value of the limit. It's a little bit less algebra, a little bit less. Um, use of the no, binomial yeah, formula. Um, I mean, it it's just form. it's just simpler. So let's say we've got yeah. f of x equals x squared plus two x. What was that minus three? Like we had in the last video, and we were interested in the slope at x equals negative three. Well, we already know what the answer is going to be, um, but we can find this. I'm using this definition as well. Um, we, I think the definition, using the other definition, we found that our um, slope was negative four at that x value. Um, let's see if we can find the same value using this definition. So f prime of negative three is equal to the limit 
as x approaches negative 3, of f of x minus f of negative 3 divided by x minus a negative 3, which is the same as x plus 3. That's easy enough to find. All you have to do is evaluate f of negative 3 and substitute, or by substituting x equals negative 3 here. So we're going to take our input and square it. We're going to add two times our input. We're going to subtract three. So we've got nine minus six minus three, which happens to be zero. And then in the numerator, we have the function itself. Yep. Okay, good. That's like the only day. What's your name? If they have any time from 9 a.m. Well, if anything, I won't be good for you. Do you like, are you available on the whole day? Yeah, the whole day. I'm going to sit in my phone today. Well, if I can substitute x equals negative 3 in the numerator and denominator and get an answer out that makes sense, well, then I can just, I'll uh, just do that. And then the rational functions are continuous on their domains. But we have a problem. If we plug in negative three to the numerator, well, we get zero because that uh, is, that would be f of negative three. And so negative three squared plus two times negative three, that's nine minus six minus three. It's going to give us zero. And then we're dividing by negative three plus three, which is zero. So that's a zero over zero in determinant form. We can get rid of that, though, um, and handle that because it's a rational function. By factoring, we know that if x equals negative 3 is a 0, then that means x plus 3 must be a factor. So just have to ask ourselves, well, this is going to be x plus or minus a constant times x plus 3, and that has to equal this. So what times 3 is going to give me the negative 3 minus 1 will work? x times x is x squared, outer times outer is 3x, inner times inner is um, minus 1x, 3x minus x is 2x, and last times last is never get negative 3. So these functions are equal to each other. This function is undefined at x equals negative 3, but if I reduce that, any number divided by itself is 1, as long as that number is not 0. And we're not, that number isn't 0, because x is not equal to negative 3 when we compute the limit. So the limit of this function is equal to the limit of this function. Or in other words, the graph of um, this function, uh, or the graph of this function, it's just the graph of this line, y equals x minus 1, with a hole in it at negative 3. So when we evaluate this at negative 3, we have negative 3 minus 3, or excuse me, negative 3 minus 1, which is negative 4. All right. Now, I know that could be a little confusing, because when we visualize computing this limit, we would be visualizing this line with a hole in it and thinking about what happens as x approaches negative 3. We're interpreting it differently now. Here, we're actually thinking about this parabola and thinking about the slope. This process actually allows us to find the slope at x equals negative 3 by looking at the slope of the secant line near x equals a negative 3. And then letting that second point, x, f of x, approach the first point. And it turns out that as that uh, second point approaches the first point, um, the slope approaches negative 4. So uh, visually, again, we can graph this parabola. We've done it before. When x equals negative 1, we've got f of negative 1 is negative 1 squared plus two times negative one minus three. So we got that that was negative four. We did that in the last video. And then at negative three, our function value is zero. Uh, the slope and then of the tangent line the slope of the tangent line is a prime of negative one which happened to be negative four a prime of negative one a prime of negative three uh, which is uh, negative four. And so I'm at this point, and I can go uh, down four and over one to find another point on my tangent line and then just graph it. And if I had graphed it to scale, I have the same slope. Um, this line would have the same slope as my curve. 
have like specific times for your person to go to that we're really not there by nine. Yeah, when visualizing the limit, we're thinking about the graph of this function and the graph of this related function. But when we interpret, or but when we're calculating this derivative, we're thinking about this as the slope of the tangent line at a particular location. So if you wanted to, so that's our tangent line. You could try to visualize that by saying that this is the point. X equals negative three, uh, Y equals F of negative three, which happens to be the point negative three zero. And then finding the point Q, and then drawing the tangent line there. This is at F of X. So change the slope of the secant. It's change in y over change in x. So it's um, f of x minus zero divided by x minus negative three. Subtracting negative three is the same as adding three. Yeah. And so we get f of x, which was x squared plus 2x minus 3, all divided by x plus 3. And that tells us that that's what the slope is going to be in general. And then as we let the second point get close to the first point, or let's say we move that second point over here, and then down here, and then maybe over here, we see that these uh, tangent or these secant lines approach our red tangent line, and this this slope is negative. Um, and this slope is slightly more negative, and this slope is slightly more negative, and this slope, slope, slope is slightly more negative as these. Um, points uh, with like coordinates x and f of x approach uh, three negative three zero. The slope of these lines approaches the slope of this line. <laughs> No, it was, but all I know is so that's the idea. Now, often the computation is much easier for this um, than it is for this. Um, but what I like about this is it gives us that formula for the slope in general. This only gives us the formula for the slope of the graph at x equals x naught. And this is also easier to understand and interpret in terms of the secant line. This is also the slope of the secant line, but we have to be careful when we look at this. We might start thinking of this the same way that we thought about it in chapter one. So you kind of have to change your frame of mind when you're thinking about about the limit. But then remember, again, that this represents the limit of the slope of the secant line when you're interpreting it as a derivative. Okay, so that was a very... Um, a simple example uh, for uh, the limit definition of the derivative. And we might also be interested in the slope of the tangent line to a trig function. So let's say we're looking at y equals sine of x, and we're interested in x naught equals, let's say, pi over 4. So I've got a graph that looks like this. So the function is 0 at 0, it's 1 at pi over 2, 0 at pi, negative 1 at 3 pi over 2, and then 0 at 2 pi. And this repeats over and over again. And maybe we're interested in the tangent line here at pi over two. Uh, if I want, if this is y equals f of x, or f of x is equal to sine of x, if I want f prime at x naught, again, the slope of the tangent, value, uh, tangent line at x naught, we take the limit as x approaches x naught, of f of x, x minus f of x naught divided by x minus x naught. Now, for this particular example, x naught is pi over 4. So we might be interested in f prime of pi over 4. So we just substitute that in for x naught. f of x is sine of x. This is going to be sine of pi over 4. 
This is x minus pi over 4 down here. And each one of like pi over 4 is a 45 degree angle. So that's a 1, 1 squared of 2 triangle. If we draw it in quadrant 1, so we can tell that the sine is 1 divided by square root of 2. And then if she's not, it will be the opposite over hypotenuse. Or if you rationalize uh, that square root of 2 over 2. Uh, but yeah, I was them and try to make up. And then maybe even might be interested in evaluating that. Now, if I plug in pi over four, I end up with a zero over zero in determinant form. So we have to do something else. So I'd say, okay, how can I find that value if it's a zero over zero in determinant form? Well, in this case, it might be easier if we use the other definition of the derivative. F prime is the limit as delta x approaches zero of sine, or excuse me, f of x plus delta x minus f of x divided by delta x. Yeah, In this case, our sine function is f. So we have f sine of x plus delta x minus sine of x divided by delta x. And again, if we plug in delta x equals zero, we get sine of zero, or sine of x minus sine of x, which is zero over zero. So this is another zero over zero indeterminate form. Like, give me, like, saying, how on earth can we evaluate this? Well, we can if we remember this formula for the sine of a plus b. I actually don't have that memorized. I use what's called um, Euler's formula. Now, the Euler's formula says that e to the i theta equals to the sine of theta plus i times sine of theta. So if I am interested in sine of a plus b, I usually do a little bit of computation. Now, if I replace theta with a, and I have e to the i times a, and it's cosine of a plus i times sine of a. And if I replace um, theta with b, I have um, this e to the i times b is cosine of b plus i sine of b. Now, e to the i times a plus b is the same as e to the i a times e to the i b. So that's going to be cosine of a plus i sine of a times cosine of b plus i sine of b. If I distribute first times first is cosine of a, cosine of b. Okay. Outer times outer is um, complex. It's got an I as a factor. Inner times inner is also complex. And then last times last is negative, or it's I sine of A times I sine of B. I squared times sine of A sine of B is negative sine of A sine of B. So that's my real part. And the imaginary part is I times uh, cosine of A sine of B. Plus sine of a cosine of a. Basically, you've got sine of one angle times cosine of the other angle, and then you just flip the angles. Uh, sine of the other angle times cosine of the other angle, and you add them. So that that is equal to that, just using our exponent properties. If I've got two exponents of the same base, I add the exponents. But then this is also equal to to this expression evaluated at a plus b. So this is equal to cosine of the quantity a plus b plus i times sine of the quantity a plus b. So when I see this sine of x plus delta x, I'm thinking I really need the formula of sine of a plus b in terms of sine of a and sine of b and cosine of a and cosine of b. I don't actually know that formula, but I remember this identity. And I know that this identity will allow me to find that quantity by just using exponent properties and making some substitution. So this expression here is equal to this expression here, which means sine of a plus b 
that is equal to that coefficient of i and the cosine of a plus b is equal to that real part of e to the i times the quantity a plus b. So substituting a equals x and b equals delta x for our definitions. Yeah. We've got a sine of x times cosine of delta x. Plus sine of delta x times cosine of x minus sine of x all divided by um, delta x. Now I'm thinking to myself, do I know anything that will allow me to simplify this? Well, um, I notice that this term and this term have a sine of x in common, so I can group those together. And I can factor out the sine of x, so I've got sine of x times cosine of delta x minus 1. And then here, I've got a cosine of x. And then a sine of delta x over delta x, and I know that as delta x approaches zero, that limit, the limit of that function is one. Um, so we'll be able to use that later. Now, this whole thing is divided by delta x, so I could just divide this piece by delta x and this piece by delta x. And hopefully you notice we've got a couple of functions that we studied in an earlier section. In chapter one or in unit one, we know that the limit as theta approaches zero of sine of theta over theta is equal to one. And we know that the limit as theta approaches zero of one minus cosine of theta over theta equals zero. Now, if we multiply that by negative one, the opposite of zero is zero, so it still works. So this limit as delta x approaches zero of this sum can be found relatively easily using our limit laws. So delta x is what we're interested in. That's the thing that's changing. X we're imagining is fixed. So this is a function of x times a function, um, and we're taking the limit of that function, plus a function of x times a different function. So you can factor that out. F prime is sine of x times the limit as delta x approaches zero, uh, cosine of delta x minus one divided by delta x, and that's zero. And then we add cosine of x times the limit as delta x approaches zero of sine of delta x over delta x. And this limit is equal to one. So we've got sine times zero plus cosine times one. So f prime is equal to cosine of x. Like, wow, that was really tedious. We'll also examine this der derivative graphically just to convince ourselves that it's true that the slope of the cosine or the sine function is actually equal to the values of the cosine function. Uh, but we can do it algebraically as well. So using um, the limit definition of the derivative, we see that the derivative of the sine of x is equal to uh, cosine of x. And now if I want the slope of the sine function at x naught equals pi over four, we just computed that f prime was equal to cosine of x. So f prime at pi over four is actually cosine of pi over four, which is square root of two over two. And now if I want the tangent line at that location, I know that the point um, x equals pi over 4, y equals square root of 2 over 2 is on my line. That's our x naught y naught. So y is equal to y naught plus the slope at x naught times x minus x naught. And that's a change in y over change in x times a change in x. The change in x is canceled. So you get change in y plus the original y is your new y. Um, the original y value was square root of 2 over 2. The slope at x naught equals pi over 4 is square root of 2 over 2. 
And then we're subtracting uh, pi over four from our x value, and that's equal to our y value. We could simplify if we wanted to, but it's not gonna it's not gonna look that much simpler. I mean, I guess you've got this times negative pi over four, and then that expression times a one. So I guess you could write square root of two over two times x plus square root of two over two times okay. one minus pi over four. But it doesn't really look that much simpler, not to me. But if I graph the tangent line here, hopefully that tangent line is actually sort of hugging the curve at that point. And we can visualize that um, graphically on Desmos.com. So here we can um, visualize uh, that example that we were just looking at on paper. <laughs> I mean, I guess you have to sleep less. It's not in six hours to eight hours of So our uh, function is y equals f of f of x, and f of x is equal to sine of x in this case. So we've got our sine graph. We know what that looks like. If we want, we can make our step sides like multiples of pi over four. That's what I like to do. Um, and we're interested in the point where x is equal to pi over 4 and y is equal to sine of pi over 4. So that's approximately um, 0 0.707 or square root of 2 over 2 exactly. Uh, the derivative turns out to be cosine of x. Um, and we'll explore that uh, graphically, or we can explore that graphically um, as well. Um, usually I have my students graph it by hand in class, so it's a little different doing it in online class. Um, but we, we were able to show using the limit definition of the derivative that the derivative is cosine of x. You just plug in pi over four and you get cosine of pi over four, which is square root of two over two, which is approximately this number as our tangent line. And then, or as our slope of the tangent line. And then the tangent line is just the original y value, which is square root of two over two, plus the slope of the tangent, which is change in y over change in x, times the change in x, which is x minus the pi over four. And uh, that's that purple line. So we can see if we zoom in that that um, tangent line is, has exactly the same slope as the graph itself. And if you want, you can change uh, this, this value x naught. So let's see if we can't change x naught. Add a slider for x naught. So now I've got, I'm using x naught equals one rather than x naught equals pi over four. Sounds like fun. We have that right there. So as you change x naught, you can watch that tangent line change. <laughs> it's just pretty because it moves, I think. <laughs> like, ooh, it moves, but yeah, it's, it's all it is. It's always the same um, as the curve itself, or the, or the slope is always the same as the curve itself, and you can graph it. Um, like that. I don't know. I don't now, our graphs can also have a vertical tangent line, but we know that the slope of a vertical line is undefined. Um, if we look at lines of various slopes, let's just look at you know, y equals zero. That has a slope of zero, right? And then y equals one has a slope of one. Um, as the slope increases, this might be y, uh, we go uh, up however many units, let's say five, and then over one. This has a slope of five. Um, and then if we went down to negative five, we would draw a line through this point. And we'd say that this line has a slope of negative five. So as these, um, the magnitude of the slope gets larger and larger and larger, um, that line gets steeper and steeper and steeper. So if our lines increase from left to right, I almost wish I didn't draw that one decreasing one. This is the decreasing one. All of these lines have a positive slope. Yeah, well, I'm thinking, I'm thinking like 
And as um, the lines become vertical or get closer and closer to being vertical, like if the, the slope was 20, I'd go up 20 and over one. So it'd be very, very steep. Um, as uh, that limit uh, goes to infinity. So we have delta y over delta x and delta x is zero where delta y is not. Um, then we would uh, then we would have a vertical tangent. So if you have take the limit as delta x approaches zero of f of x plus delta x minus f of x divided by delta x, and you get plus or minus infinity. Well, that's going to correspond to a vertical tangent line. And I think when you think of this uh, slope of a tangent line as being delta y over delta x, that makes sense. If I have a vertical line, just let's say x equals two, a couple of points on that line might be um, x equals two, y equals negative one, and x equals two, y equals three. Change in y over change in x would be well, three minus negative one divided by two minus two. So if we could do that computation, we would have four divided by zero which is a bad thing to do. We don't want to divide by zero. Dividing by zero is never allowed, but we could let um, delta x approach uh, zero. And we um, often do that whenever we um, compute this limit. So if we have, if we're in a case where this limit gives us a non-zero constant divided by zero, um, that limit will be plus or minus infinity, which corresponds to having a tangent line that looks like this. Um, let's look at an example where that happens. Let's say that we're interested in um, f of x equal, let's say the cube root of x. We know the cube root of x looks like this. Looks like x cubed just on its side. Cube root of zero is zero. Cube root of one is one. Cube root of negative one is negative one. And then cube root of eight. Oops. is 2, because 2 times 2 times 2 is 8, and the cube root of negative 8 is negative 2. And so we see something that looks like this. And I believe um, the way I've drawn it, it doesn't look like it has a vertical tangent line. Um, but I believe that this has a vertical tangent line at x equals 0. To show that, let's compute the limit as delta x approaches 0 of f of x plus delta x minus f of x divided by delta x. And then show what that is as a function of x and then show that it's undefined at x equals zero. Or we could use that second uh, limit definition that we talked about. We could compute the limit as x approaches zero of f of x minus f of zero divided by x minus zero. And that is also the derivative, but it's the derivative at a particular value. It's the derivative at x equals zero. This, the way I've drawn it, it looks like the derivative is one, um, but it's actually a derivative of um, or an infinite uh, value right there, which is a little bit difficult to see. It might be easier to see on Desmos. So let's substitute in our function. We're talking about the cube root of x. So we've got the cube root of x minus f of zero. Cube root of zero is zero. And I'm dividing by x. Well, actually, this is very simple to evaluate. The cube root of x is x to the one third power. That's x to the first. If I want to simplify this, I just subtract the exponents. So this is x to the negative two thirds, or equivalently. 1 over x to the 2 thirds. As x approaches 0, it's helpful to think of it this way. We're going to have different behavior on the left and right of 0. So I want to think of this, or you, you could potentially have different behavior on the left and right of 0. So I'm going to write this this way. Remember, the x to the 2 thirds power is the cube root of x squared. That number in the denominator becomes the index of the radical. That becomes the exponent of the x. 
So as we're approaching zero from the left or the right, from tiny, where, where we're plugging in tiny positive numbers or tiny negative numbers, either way, we're going to take those and square them. So the result is positive, And then we're going to take the cube root, which is positive. So this is one divided by a tiny positive number, which is a large positive number. So f prime of x is undefined. If it were defined, it would be defined by this limit. Um, but this limit turns out to be infinity. Since the limit is equal to infinity, that tells us that f prime of x, uh, or f prime of zero, excuse me, does not exist. Or we can say that f prime of zero is undefined. And each of those tells us that f has a vertical tangent line. At x equals zero. Now, this is something I'm actually kind of a stickler about in class, um, because we say that functions are undefined and limits do not exist. But the derivative is a limit, so we can say that this derivative is a limit that does not exist, or we can say that this derivative is a function that's undefined. So either terminology works in this case, but when I refer to the limit, or if I refer to a function value in general, like f of zero, I, I would use different terminology for each of those. Limits don't exist, function values are undefined, but since derivatives are limits, then we can use both. And let's visualize this on desmos.com. Looks like my tangent line should look like this, but that's got to be wrong. Yeah, must be something wrong with my graph. Let's look at the cube root of x dot line. So this is the graph of the cube root of x. There's no cube root of x button on the um on desmos.com. So I'm just writing that as x to the one third power. But this picture, you can see that it does have a vertical tangent line there. Um. Vertical tangent line is just x equals the value of interest. So x equals zero is our tangent line. So I've graphed that. And you can see that the function is, is equal to that right there. If you want to, um, we could look at um, the slope of the secant line again. So let's plot um, zero and f of zero. I guess I need to do that for a particular value for a particular function f. So I'll call that function f now. Yeah. So now we're plotting that point at zero, zero. And then let's let um, H just be a number. Sometimes it gives me a hard time unless I type something else. So here's my H value. And I want to plot h and f of h on my graph. And then it has shoulder and then b on that shoulder to make sure. See, I'm not going anywhere. I'm locked in. I'm locked in. Okay. Oh, yeah, I know. So I was going to like this. And now we'll uh, sketch the secant line again. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, where do you go? There's our secant line, or our slope of the secant line from those from this point to this point. We'll say y equals f of zero, it's the point of interest, plus the slope of the secant line times x minus zero, which is just x. Now we've graphed our secant line. Now let's think about what happens to the secant line as h goes to zero. So there's my secant line as h goes to zero. We can see that the slope of the secant is getting larger and larger and larger. And you see it's like 7.3 when h equals 0 
I'm curious, what is it equal to when h equals 0 0.0001? See, when h is equal to 0 0.00001, our secant line, our, our slope of our secant is uh, 10,000. So it's almost vertical. If I keep adding zeros, look, the slope of the secant is now 46,415. Add another zero, 215,443. That slope just keeps getting larger and larger and larger as h approaches zero. Now let's see what happens if we approach zero from the other side. Well, I still have the same slope. Um, when h is equal to negative 0 0.1, we get this. Negative 0 0.01, we get that. Add zeros, we get a, sleep, a, secant, a slope of the secant of 100, then 464, then uh, 2,154, then 10,000, and so on. As you add more zeros here, um, where our h value is getting very, very small, but negative. And the slope of the slope of the secant is what in this case twenty one million five hundred forty four thousand three hundred and forty six. Yeah, that's huge. Um, so as h approaches zero, um, the slope approaches infinity, which is why x equals zero. Um, is the tangent line. Yes. Um, and that's a vertical tension. All right, one last thing and then we'll move on. So here's some terms and notation that we need to know as we um, continue studying this material. Differentiation is the process of computing a derivative. Oh yeah, well, I kind of figure out what we did now, so when we evaluated this limit, we were attempting to compute f prime of zero. It turned out that that was undefined. That process is the differentiation of square root or the cube root of x. Um, let's see, what else? Instantaneous rate of change. Now we tend to use this terminology, instantaneous rate of change, when we're talking about applications of derivatives. Everything that we've talked about so far has been geometric. We're saying, okay, the slope of the function at a particular value of x is equal to this limit of the slope of the secant line. Then. But this is the limit as delta x approaches zero of the change in y over the change in x. So it might be, this is telling us how fast y changes as x changes at a particular x value. So when we get, um, let's say like in this example from the uh, earlier, that the slope of the secant is zero, we're saying that y changes by zero units when x changes by one unit when x is equal to negative one. Or when x is equal to negative three, the y is decreased by uh, four units when x increases by one unit. So that's the slope of the tangent. I mean, of course, it's changing. Um, as x changes it by one unit, like, you know, as soon as we move off of that x equals negative three, the slope changes again. But in general, in the vicinity of that point, we're saying that the slope of the curve itself is negative four. So that change in y over change in x is negative four. We go down uh, four units in the y direction when x increases by one unit. Um, so that is what we mean by the instantaneous rate of change when we're talking about um, geometry. How, how fast is y changes, x changes. But you might be interested in something like the area of a circle, that's pi r squared. You might be interested in the instantaneous change in the area of the circle as the radius changes. Um, we could compute that by using the limit as delta r goes to zero of a evaluated at r plus delta r minus a evaluated at r all divided by delta r. So we could compute that ourselves. Now we also have the opportunity to compute that at a particular value, um, but this will give us a formula for the instantaneous change in area of a circle as the radius changes. So here's our, our circle, let's say. Let's say that that's a circle of radius one. Um, 
So eventually we want the instantaneous change in the area as the radius changes at r equals one. And to find that, I would evaluate this derivative. So we have a evaluated at r plus delta r. So that's pi times um, r squared, where r has been replaced by r plus delta r. And then we have a evaluated at r, so that's pi r squared. Oops. Don't forget to take the limit as delta r approaches zero. Take all of that and divide by delta r. It's easy enough to do. Um, you've got a pi as a factor here and here. We can factor that uh, constant outside of our limit. And this is r plus delta r quantity squared. So r squared plus 2r delta r plus delta r squared minus r squared all divided by delta r. And the r squareds reduce. So we've got pi times the limit as delta r goes to zero of this quantity. And these two guys have a delta r in common. If we plug in our delta r equals zero, we get zero over zero, which is an indeterminate form. But if we factor out the delta r, we have delta r times 2r plus delta r. 2r delta r gives us the first term. Delta r times delta r gives us the delta r squared, all divided by delta r there. And now that factor of delta r um, appears in the numerator and denominator. Since delta r is not zero, but it's getting very, very close to zero, that's just a number divided by itself, which is one, as long as r, delta r isn't zero. So the limit of this expression is actually equal to the limit of this expression as delta r goes to zero. Now this expression is continuous at delta r equals zero. So we plug in delta r equals zero. And we once we're substituting that value of delta r, and we don't need the limit notation anymore, then we get two pi r is the instantaneous change in area um, as the radius changes. And I think that that makes sense. Do you guys recognize that formula? 2 pi r, that's the circumference of our circle. And that makes sense. So we're saying, OK, increase the radius by one unit. How much does the area change by? Well, it's 2 pi r um, units of area. So that's going to be unit squared per unit. That's uh, this 2 pi r unit squared is the change in the area per one unit change in the radius r. Um, and it's the formula for the circumference, which makes sense because when I increase that radius, I see something that looks like that circumference. But you want to keep those units in mind. Um, and you don't want to cancel the units. <laughs> Um, these are the units for the area, and that's the units for the radius. Now, to write down the, to recognize that these are the appropriate units, it's helpful to have an alternate notation for this derivative. So let's talk about the other um, notation for the derivative. Um, we have lots of different notations. F prime of x is one way to represent the derivative of f of x. Sometimes you'll see f prime of t if the independent variable is t, or if y of t is our function, y prime of t. Sometimes uh, the independent variable is impl implied, so we'll just write y prime um, or like g prime or something like that. This is called prime notation. And we can also use what's called Leibniz notation. I like Leibniz notation a lot because it shows you the independent variable, even if it isn't stated explicitly like it is in these expressions. So we might write df dx here, that the change in f with respect to x, the instantaneous change in f with respect to x. This is df dt. This is dy dt. Y prime, well, it really depends what the independent variable is. You can usually tell from context. That might be dy dx. G prime is dg dx or dg dt, depending on what the independent variable is. Those are all first derivatives um, and that's Leibniz notation. Sometimes you'll see differential operator notation. So people will write d of f of x, which means f prime of x. 
sometimes. Um, you'll see a subscript X there to indicate we're differentiating with respect to X. So that is one notation. And if Y is equal to F of X, we can call that dy dx. Um, and sometimes we'll use this differential or this derivative notation. The derivative with respect to X of F of X is equal to F prime of X, which is equal to dy dx. Or you can call that y prime. So we've got prime notation, Leibniz notation, and this differential operator notation, and this alternate differential operator notation. And those are all for first derivatives. For the second derivative, that's just when you take the derivative twice. We call that y double prime. Third derivative is y triple prime. The nth derivative is denoted this way. After the third derivative, we don't use the prime notation anymore. We just start writing the order of the derivative in the parentheses here. Now, if you're thinking that this is really tedious, you're like, I have to do this over and over again. Um, it turns out that we do, but we're going to have, we're going to derive a lot of shortcuts um, for these derivatives so that we aren't relying on the limit definitions every time to compute them. Um, in that case, once we know our formulas, um, those shortcuts for computing the derivative that don't require the limit um, definition, um, computing the second derivative, third derivative, and fourth derivative is just as easy as taking the derivative of the last derivative and then just doing it again and doing it again um, as you compute derivatives um, over and over again for the same function. So this is prime notation for the nth derivative. Um, if we start with dy dx, the second derivative looks like this. That's Leibniz notation. The two is a superscript here and here. Um, the, and you can think of this this way. This is the derivative with respect to x of dy dx. And so if you look at that notation and think about simplifying it, that d and then the dy becomes that d squared y. And that dx and dx becomes the dx squared. We don't use parentheses there. Just convention to write it like this. The third derivative looks like this. And of course, the, the independent and dependent variables could be different. Like x could be a function of t, s could be a function of t, just depending on what the application is. Um, like with this application, the area is a function of r. So this might be da dr. And that's what we would have here, da dr equals that. The nth derivative looks also, like that. It's like yeah, this. we we can kind of like that. I mean, that's how we kind of like. What should I agree? And then, if we're talking about the nth derivative of some function, I just say the nth derivative with respect to x of that function of x, which sometimes is written this way. Well, same thing. I tend to use this when I'm about to compute the uh, derivative of, of multiple derivatives of a function. So I might take the second derivative with respect to x of x cubed plus 2x squared minus 1. And that will involve taking the derivative with respect to x of the first derivative of that function. And we're going to learn shortcuts for computing these derivatives. So we would compute this derivative first using those shortcuts, and then we'll take the derivative of the results um, to get the second derivative. And let's just say we'll compute this using basic differentiation rules. And those basic differentiation rules will be derived in another video. Okay, a um, couple other terms. We say that F is differentiable at X. If this limit, which represents the derivative of f at x, if that limit is well defined. So if this limit um, exists, or if f prime of x, which is a function that is defined this way, um, is well defined, we say f is differentiable on a particular interval. If f prime 
is defined at every x value on the interval. I want the interesting going on. Um, I think that that's it for our terminology. All right. So, um, just to summarize, we start. Here is our other definition of the derivative. If you want to compute the derivative at a point, you can do the change in y over change in x this way as x approaches that particular x value. And that's going to give us the derivative at that x value. If you want the derivative as a function of x, you want to use this limit definition of the derivative. But either way, we're taking the limit as that change in x approaches 0. Um, or here, alternatively, we're letting this x value approach this x value, which still means that the change in x is approaching 0. So it's just different notation for the same thing. But this gives us the function of x, and this gives us a number that goes, corresponds to that particular x value. Both of them represent the slope of the tangent line of the function at that particular x value here or as a function of x in general over there. And we talked about vertical tangent lines. If that uh, limit definition of the derivative yields a limit that's plus or minus infinity, the function has a vertical tangent line. And then we talked about all of this terminology. Uh, because um, the derivative is actually a limit, we can say that the derivative at a, a particular x value does not exist, or we can say that the derivative is undefined. We use those interchangeably. Normally, we say functions are undefined and limits do not exist, but since the derivative is both a limit and a function, either um, terminology works. And then we've got the higher order derivatives both in prime notation and um, Leibniz notation. That's it. Um, we'll talk more um, about uh, differentiability and the relationship between differentiability and continuity in the next video.